Welcome, everyone. I have the pleasure of introducing you today to Dr. Sandra Dalton Smith. She is a board certified internal medicine physician and work life integration researcher. She's also the founder of Restoracis, a professional development agency dedicated to restoring well being in the workplace by working with companies that care about their employees and wanting them to succeed. I first heard about Dr. Sandra Dalton Smith through a podcast I listened to where she talked about the seven types of rest. And this was really impactful for me at the time because I was stressed out as all get out in a previous job. It was a job that I loved, but I just was always just tired. <laughs> and no matter how much rest I got, no, mat no matter how much I try to catch up and sleep on the weekends, I was still exhausted. And I couldn't figure out why. And then when I heard her share about the seven types of rest, it was as if the light bulbs came on and I was able to take a deep breath because I realized that although I was getting enough sleep, I wasn't getting enough emotional and creative rest. And after reading more about what she had to share and some of the advice that she gave, my life began to feel a little bit more integrated. So my hope in, is that by the time you listen to this, by the end of this episode, that you'll also be encouraged to to see what areas of your life could you use more rest. So without further ado, um, Dr. Dalton Smith, just would love for you to share a little bit more about yourself. I feel like I just gave an overview, but. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you for that. Um, as you mentioned, I'm an internal medicine physician, uh, board certified in clinical practice for about 20 years. And my backstory is that I burned out um, about 10 years into that clinical practice and quickly realized that traditional medical um, approach to burnout basically was focused around getting more sleep, as you mentioned, or going on vacation, of which I tried both and neither one of them helped. And so I got to a point where it just was a really desperate situation. It's like, what do you do when everything that's the solution is not working? Um, and I think that's when it really started to, to come to me that there's something more out there that's depleted within me. There's something other than just needing to take a break. Um, and that led to kind of researching and looking more into how do we restore? How do we get to a place of feeling rejuvenated and replenished? And, you know, the reality of that for me was that, you know, all the research was basically fo focusing on cessation activities. What are those things that we do to stop and we rest in that we stop working? And then the revelation that came was that rest sometimes is active. Sometimes you have to do something to pour back into the place of emptiness. And so that's kind of where the focus then shifted to. What are those restorative activities that I can do to pour back into the places that have been depleted? And that began with finding out what are the places that are depleted. That's what led to the book, Sacred Rest, Recover Your Life, Redo Your Energy, Restore Your Sanity, and the seven types of rest that are discussed within it. Yeah, gosh. I'm so glad you mentioned that. That was one of the things that was really eye-opening for me when I read um, part of your book was that I can actually be active in terms of my rest. Because just like you said, I just thought that I just needed to sleep more or, <laughs> or like go on vacation. But to realize that I know I can do things that are creative in order to replenish that aspect of me and my heart. And I, I remember you shared a story once about how part of this the way it came to you was you had come home from, I think the grocery store and you just, you put your groceries down and you just lied, laid on your floor and you were just like, I am exhausted. Can you describe that moment to us? Yeah, actually, you know, I open up the book with that because that was a pivotal moment for me. I, I that particular day was a full day at work. So, you know, I'd been at work from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, I do traditional internal medicine, so I have an office, I go in the hospital, I go into ER, ICU, all the things, and on that particular day, I came home after picking up my kids from daycare, and I set my, it wasn't groceries, it was babies, I set oh. <laughs> my babies literally in front of the TV, and I was like, okay, I, you know, I just need a moment um, before I do anything else with my family, I just need a moment to myself, so I put them in front of the TV, because I felt like, you know, they were, they were toddler ages. So one was a little baby, couldn't move at all. The other one was a toddler and the TV was great entertainment. He wouldn't move after being put in front of it. So I felt they were safe. And I was like, I just need a moment. And I just laid out on my floor, your floor, and I'm laying on this floor 
you know, looking at my four years um, at the front of the house has this huge chandelier. It's like this, you know, gigantic ceiling foyer. And I'm mm -hmm. looking at this huge chandelier and this beautiful home, you know, all the fixings of success that I had kind of worked toward. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, if this is success, I don't want it. I don't like my life right now. I, I'm exhausted, mind, body, spirit, and soul. I, I'm not enjoying any of the blessings that I prayed and asked God, asked God for and desired in my life and, you know, work and aspired towards. And I'm like, if this is what I want, if this is what I've been working for, then I don't want it. It's not what I anticipated. And that's kind of the, the initial turning point that led to that. There's got to be more. There's got to be something else. Um, and like I said, the very first thing I tried after that was I must just need more sleep. I, I must just be sleep deprived. That's all I could think of as far as the reason that I was burned out. Cause I, I didn't feel depressed. You know, I didn't feel suicidal or, you know, anything like that or anxious or any of that. Mm -hmm. I was just exhausted <laughs> every yeah. way that you could possibly be exhausted. Yeah. So then what then led you to begin to research the the seven types of rest and what what like once you realized okay I'm exhausted what was the next step that you took for me the the, the very next step was I came up with a plan for getting better sleep because that's all that I could find in the research that you know talked about how you know burnout recovery so I started looking at improving the quality of my sleep and I can't say that it didn't help some because I was sleep deprived <laughs> So that was true. I was sleep deprived, but there was so much more than that. So I began with trying to improve the quality of my sleep. And, you know, as it started getting better, I mean, I could tell that I was sleeping soundly, you know, getting, I went from getting like maybe five hours a night to getting somewhere close to eight to nine hours a night. I mean, the, when the second the babies went down, I didn't try to do a thing else. I went down to sleep. Yeah. But even after getting, you know, eight, nine hours of sleep, I was waking up the next morning, sometimes still exhausted. And I think that's really when my eyes became open because it's like, I can't need more than eight to nine <laughs> hours of sleep. Uh -huh. I mean, that's just not logical. Yeah. And, and, you know, we tried vacations, we'd go on vacation and we'd have fun and I would forget about work and I'd still be exhausted. Yeah. And so from there, that's when it's kind of opened up that there's got to be something more. And the very first thing after that revelation was looking at, I looked in two places. I'm a person of um, who really believes that faith and science are not mutually exclusive, that they work together. Yeah. So I looked within the Bible and then I looked within scientific research. I went, yeah. I went to both sources to try to figure out there's, what is the connection here? Where is there a place that can be restored? And started pulling down these places that I felt like, okay, I, this might become exhausted. This might become depleted. This might need to be energized. And I had a list long past seven, you know, initially. Oh that I was looking at and I was like, okay, you know, let me work through what the science says after looking through kind of the, spir the spiritual kind of aspect of that. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of areas where there wasn't a lot of science on, like the creative aspect, but there was a lot in the spiritual aspect on that. And so, you know, once I got some of these areas flushed out and kind of narrowed down to about, you know, at the time, probably about 10 or 12, that I got it narrowed down to, I then started looking at the application of that. What are things I can do, restorative activities to pour back into these places and kind of putting together kind of my own little personal list, trying things out, seeing what felt like it worked for me or didn't work. And since I was actively in practice, I had plenty of people coming into my office every day telling me I'm exhausted, I'm tired, and I couldn't find anything wrong with them. Yeah, <laughs> their yeah. thyroid was normal, their, you know, all their cortisol stress levels were normal, you know, nothing was wrong with them. So I would start then sharing some of my kind of impromptu research in real time with real people. Nice. Because it wasn't like a clinical study. I wasn't giving them drugs, you know, or anything that was dangerous. I was giving them ideas on how to restore themselves. Yeah. And so it was amazing to see that as I was doing this and sharing with them what I was learning, I, you know, they come back two weeks, or two months later, whatever it was, and they say, you know, that thing you said about, you know, doing X, Y, Z, man, that really helped me in, in this area. Yeah. So it was, it was like ongoing, active, real life research with real life people that crossed every social economic barrier you can think of. Mm -hmm. I had everyone from other physicians, their families, attorneys, oh, nice. the janitors, the teachers, the factory workers, to unemployed, to, you know, it was like, no matter what the, the demographics were. 
Mm-hmm. There, were su- there were seven that seemed to be consistent. Didn't matter if you were living in a million dollar house or living in the project. And that's where the seven types came from. That is incredible. And I love that you were able to apply it directly with your, with your patients and, and all walks of life. So now people are probably wondering, okay, what are the seven types of rest? Can you describe them to us, please? Yeah. So just to name them, to get them out the way for people who are keeping lists, (laughs) the seven include the physical, mental, spiritual, emotional, social, sensory, and creative. Uh, The physical being actually having two components to it. It has the passive components, which include things like sleeping and napping. And then it has an active component that includes things like walk, you know, leisure walking, stretching, yoga, Uh, massage therapy, using the foam roller, you know, even down to the ergonomics of your workstation. It's those things that have to do with how your body feels, the circulation, the lymphatic drainage, the restoration that comes from keeping our body kind of fluid and allowing the blood and everything that we need for restoration to flow properly. Um, Mental rest deals specifically with the ability to clear and focus your mind. A lot of us spend a lot of time um, with busy brain, you know, we're always thinking all the thoughts all the time, over-processing information, um, always kind of coming up with ideas whenever we're trying to be quiet at night, you're trying to go to sleep and you're thinking all the thoughts. That's, you know, that's what a mental rest deficit looks like. Your brain is so overly active, you can't really focus your thoughts and clear your mind. So those activities are those things that lead to kind of mindfulness type practices to clear your thoughts. Um, spiritual rest differs for every person depending on their own religious and spiritual beliefs, but at the very core of that, it's kind of having this greater idea of how you intersect with the world in general, that feeling of belonging, of acceptance, of being loved, that sense of having a greater purpose in destiny than just you. So it's how you connect with that. It's how you connect with your own neat purpose uh, and really your ability to feel like you belong, like you're needed. Um, The next type of rest is emotional rest. That deals with our mental health. Mental rest deals with our processing. Emotional rest deals with our mental health aspect of it. And it's the ability to just be very real, raw, and authentic about what you're feeling. Not people pleasing, not holding on to, um, you know, things people say and allowing it to kind of get into you and affect how, what you believe about yourself is keeping that place of just truly staying authentic and open and sharing what you're feeling rather than holding on to and harboring it so that it then becomes toxic or leads to feelings of traumatic um, mental areas and things like that. Um, The next is social rest. Social rest identifies how people interact with us within our lives. Every person is either negatively pulling from our social energy or positively pouring back into our social energy. And so you want to make an, uh, really be aware of how people are pulling on you. Oftentimes, the people we love the most are the ones who are pulling more from our social energy. They need things from us, you know, your family, your, your parents, your clients, your coworkers, they all need things from you. So they're negatively pulling from you socially, not that they are negative, it's just the dynamics of how they pull from you negatively pulls from that energy. And so you need to be aware of that so that you have people in your life that you know are pouring back into you, that are life-giving that are feeding that part of you. And yes, your family and you know, your spouse can be positive socially, but that you, it takes an intentional effort to keep that in a good checks and balance. Because what happens oftentimes is we don't keep a check and balance. And so those relationships consistently pull without the benefit of pouring back into us. The last two types of rest are sensory and creative. Sensory rest evaluates your sensory inputs and it helps to keep you from becoming sensory overloaded. Oftentimes we're not aware of the sensory inputs in our environment, whether that be the lights, the sounds, the smells, you know, if your office is beside a elevator, you know, in your building and you're hearing ding, 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 you know, all day long. Yes, you think you may be tuning some of that out or if you're working from home and your kids or your dogs or your cats or whatever it is making noise all day, you may think you're tuning that out. However, your senses are still perceiving that. They perceive it to blunt it. And so your tuning out is taxing your senses. And what most of us don't realize is that when you become sensory overloaded or sensory overwhelmed, our natural response is irritation, agitation, rage, or anger. 
Mm-hmm. And so if you find that you tend to be on edge all the time or you get real, you know, end of the day, you're not hangry. You're, you're just angry because <laughs> your sensory overload has kind of been taxed throughout the day. And we need mm-hmm. to be aware of that and do things to downgrade our sensory input, whether that be an hour where you do noise cancellation earphones in the middle mm-hmm. of the day, just to kind of get a reprieve from whatever that ongoing noise is or mm-hmm. tuning down your, um, your brightness on your screen at nighttime if you're on your computer or dimming the mm-hmm. lights at a certain period before you go to bed. So many mm-hmm. different ways to downgrade sensory input, but you have to be consciously aware of that to be able to even process that information. And then the last one, creative rest, looks at how we pour back into our own creativity. And so many people, when I talk about creative rest, they automatically think, oh, I don't need that. I'm not a musician, an author, or a painter, or whatever. But really, if you're someone who's a problem solver, problem solving is a creative process. You take something that isn't and to lead to an answer that you desire. That's creativity in itself. Yeah. Innovation's creativity. Brainstorming's creativity. So most of us are using excessive amounts of creative energy with absolutely no process or system in place for pouring back into that bucket that's being depleted. And so you can sleep all day long. You're not going to improve your creative rest deficit by closing your eyes and going to sleep. Creative rest is rejuvenated when we allow ourselves to appreciate beauty in whatever form it is that inspires us. So whether that be natural beauty, like the ocean or the mountains or trees or flowers or man-made beauty, like music and dance and art. Whatever it is that inspires you and kind of awakens something inside of you, creativity, we have to put an importance on that as well if we're a person who's using a lot of creative energy. Wow, that was an excellent explanation of the the seven types of rest. I remember when I first learned about each one and I, on your website, you have a, a rest quiz. I remember taking it and seeing that I was really low on, at the time, this was a few years ago, um, emotional rest as well as um, creative rest. I remember I, once you take the quiz, I really highly recommend anyone listening to take this quiz because it's really eye-opening. Um, but once you take it, um, Dr. Dalton Smith provides um, like a three-week, um, uh, every, every day she'll put, um, Gosh, I'm drawing a blank here, but advice on how to grow in each of those areas. Mm -hmm. And so when I read it, I remember reading one about how to just go for a walk. (laughs) Like, I know that sounds so simple, but yeah. So anyway, I started to do that on a daily basis. And there was a park near my house, which had like a a large body of water. And I remember I would just, just stand and I'll look at the water and I would feel so refreshed by the end. And I didn't have to be out there very long. Maybe it was even 10 minutes but just looking at this large body of water and just being in awe at the beauty. Oh my gosh. I went back and I was able to just continue working and it really made a huge difference. So thank you for your research. Because the the research supports that. When we, um, what very little research there was that was already in the books about creative rest. That was the one that talked about people, uh, about 60% of the population experience. They didn't call it creative rest. What they said was sense of feeling of refreshing after being around large bodies of water. Mm. And so, you know, the benefit of that is that one of the studies that looked at this refreshing around nature, specifically with water, looked at the MRIs of people's brains after they had looked at actual ocean. Then it looked at it after they looked at pictures of the ocean And then they looked at it after they looked at colors that resemble the ocean. So the aquas, the teals, all of that. And what they found was that that activity in the brain that occurs, that leads to that feeling was the same across all three platforms. No, no response. If it looked at grass, you know, or something else, (laughs) but but those three platforms, it was identical. And the benefit of that is if someone's listening and they're like, well, good for her. She has a body of water near her house, but I live in the middle of nowhere, USA, you know, with no water to be seen. You can take a picture of whatever body of water inspires you, put it as the lock screen on your computer or your phone. Now you've automated creative rest into your environment. That's what we do with companies, you know, with companies that are like some of the tech companies that we work with, we look at. Your, your, your particular team, what are the colors that inspire them? 
this is why places like WeWorks and you know some of the other uh, places that have really kind of latched onto this idea use some of those accent walls and mural mm. walls within their workplace. Or you go in hospitals and you'll see artwork along certain halls in the hospital. That is what they're implementing. They're implementing creative rest. They're bringing in beauty so that at least some people within that place will appreciate it. You know, and particularly within, if you're doing an art wall where you have local artists, this is an idea for anybody who has an empty wall in your building, ask local artists to, to co commission their art to be on the wall. They can have the price of their phone number and all that good stuff so they can try to sell it. But when you do that, one, some of the art could be natural art. Some of the art can be abstract. Some of the art could be photography. You can have all, so you're hitting so many different people in that one art wall gallery that you have. And you're actually benefiting the community with the local artists as well. Oh, that's such a great idea. And it reminds me of an office building I used to work at probably about five years ago it was a pretty dreary building. It was about eight stories and walking in there was just pretty blah. <laughs> it was very gray. But then I noticed one day they put a local art exhibit on the walls and I, it made a huge difference. <laughs> like I would stop by each one and I was like, oh, wow. Like it just, it did something in my brain to just, I don't know, relax me. And I mm -hmm. had a lot, a little bit more energy as I walked into the office. So it works as an employee. I would say that. <laughs> And it's so simple. <clears throat> I think that's the thing we have to keep in mind with um, all of these types of rest. You mentioned the rest quiz. Um, you know, when people go to restquiz.com and they take that free assessment, occasionally I'll get an email that says, oh, no, I'm low. And you know, I, I get emails that say I failed the quiz, which is not <laughs> possible. It's an assessment. It's not, like, it's not like school. You can't fail it. And that's what the emails usually say. I failed your quiz. Um, I'm, you know, I'm low in all seven types of rest. And, you know, the thing is, I was low in all seven times. That's why I was in the situation yeah. I was in. But the, the thing is, you don't try to fix all seven at one time. You pick one or two that you're going to focus on. And as you're working on those one or two, you know, then you don't have to feel like, you know, it's so overwhelming. And you don't have to try to isolate a period of time to get the rest. Like, I'm going to try to get these two fixed in the seven days of my vacation. Yeah. No, you're, you've got to integrate it within your life in such a way that it doesn't matter when you take your next vacation. You don't want to only be rested on the weekend or when you get a, you know, a three day weekend or a long vacation or whatever it is. You want to be able to have these things be something you can do in the middle of a work week or in the middle of a work day. So that's always the goal to make rest very accessible in your life so that you're not having to overthink it but as yeah. much as possible, automate some of these things so that you, you don't even having to worry about, am I getting creative fresh? You know, you've got 15 screen pop-ups that are inspirational to you. And so, you know, you get surprised whenever whatever pops up, but you've already automated some of these, these applications. That, those are, that's really good advice. So I'm really curious, like I have my own reasons for this, but I'm really curious just based on your research and working with so many different people all over why do we resist rest? Like, why do we just like glorify being busy and being stressed out and kind of have it as like a little metal that we, <laughs> we put on our shoulders? That's, that's a great question. Uh, and it has some tricky answers because I think it's multifaceted. I think there are two main issues and one is just our culture. Our culture is built up around this, you know, I'll rest when I die or, you know, grind till you make it kind of mentality where we glorify, you know, excessive work. We, we try to, it's almost like you mentioned, like a badge of honor that you wear that, look, I don't, I don't require as much rest as this other person. Look at me, you know, kind of thing. But, you know, when we, when we really look at the lives of those people who are living like that, they're usually not happy. You know, they're, they're, they have success without a successful life. And so, you know, it's one of those things to say, am I, do I want a life that just looks good on the outside or do I want a life that feels good to actually live? That's the decision that I actually had to make, you know, because I could have kept going like I was going and had a life that looked very good on the outside, but I didn't enjoy, yeah. or I could have a life that I enjoyed and let it align up with the things that I do on the outside. Yeah. So I think that's the first thing. 
is that our culture is built up this mindset. And that's, but, you know, that's a big part of the work that I would say that I do. It's, it's mainly a kind of culture mindset shift on rest and the value of it and really why it's such an important part of, of what we, how, are, how we live if we want to get the best out of ourselves and out of others, that we can't always be pouring from our, our emptiness, pouring from our depletion, but we have to get to a place where, we're a, where we, we understand that to be the best version of myself to give at the highest level of my own capacity, I need to be well rested. And the second part of that I would say is for some of us, we've grown up with, with kind of sometimes family and in our own personal mindset that um, our worth is really wrapped up in our work. And so it's like, if I'm not working, then I'm not worthy. And so I have to work to feel worthy of whatever the good things that come into my life. We, yeah. we don't allow ourselves just to, believe that our life can have blessings in the rest. We feel like if there's any good to be had, I have to, to labor into that, that blessing, into whatever that thing is that we're desiring. And so I think those are probably the two big issues, kind of the cultural mindset, and then that personal mindset of, of our own worth being tied up in our work. Yeah, no, I can relate to both of those things. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's definitely been a, like a process for me to, to realize that, that my value isn't in how many clients I have. My value isn't in how many in- interesting people I get to interview on this podcast. My value is not even in my marriage, which I am so happy with. It's my value is me being a beloved daughter of God. And whether I produce anything or not, he still loves me and I am still good and I'm still worthy of love. And that is a daily <laughs> process. Um, and with that, just knowing that it's okay to rest. Like I, I have to give myself permission to, to rest. I was joking with some people the other day that there are certain people in my life who like who rest well. <laughs> like, like they take time to either do something creative or go on a walk or to just read a book. And I have to say, okay, I'm reading a book now and it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> or I'm going to go on a walk and it's okay. And I don't have to listen to something while I'm walking just to, to justify why I'm going on a walk. You know what? I had that same problems. So I totally relate to that. And yeah, honestly, sometimes I, I always tell people, I wrote this book because I, I suck at this. <laughs> I am not a good rester. I, I am, I'm a workaholic. I, I unashamedly say that. I'm the type of person who I would work, work, work. And not because I got an issue with worth. Mm-hmm. I just like pr- producing. I'm a yeah. producer. You yeah. know, there are certain people who are just natural high producers. That's just how they are. That's how God created them. That's their mindset. And so that's the type of person that I am. And so as that type of person, it's hard for me to want to stop because I keep wanting to produce. Yeah. And so for myself, what I have to tell myself is whenever I, I know that I need to take a a break or to break away for a restorative activity, I tell myself, I need this. I need this. And I, I'm, I'm keen on giving other people what they need, but I slack up in giving myself what I need. And so, so the self-talk that I say to myself is I need this. I need this to be the best version of myself. I need this to put my all into this project. I need this to be able to write that research proposal. I need this to be able to fulfill what I, the contract that I have with that company. And so when I look at it that way, then it, it, it almost takes all guilt out, out yeah. of the equation because yeah. I'm recognizing I need this to be able to do and to be able to produce what I really want to produce. That's great. Um, what would, what advice would you give to a stay-at-home mom who is like, this is great, Dr. Dalton Smith, but how am I supposed to rest with three kids in tow, a husband and a house to take care of, and just a family to keep running, running smoothly? How, like, what would you give, what advice would you give to someone in that yeah. position? Yeah, interesting enough, most of my personal coaching clients are stay-at-home moms oh, really? that either have their own business. Oh. And are trying to kind of balance all of that out, so to speak. I don't like the word balance, but I call it integrated together, their work life and their home life. But um, yeah, so that's, that's a huge area of struggle for a lot of women. 
And so what I usually tell them is it's a lot simpler than they've made it out to be because what the, the goal is never to balance as people say work on one side and life on the other that's what we try to do Mm -hmm. and in doing that something always has to lose it you know it's this teeter-totter so one has to be down for the other to be up what you're really wanting is integration so that they are both flowing together in a way so that both can thrive at the same time and so we're always looking at how do we integrate restorative activities within your day So one of the things, I'll just give an example. One of the things we start with is I always have them tell me what your normal day looks like. And I mean, like the whole day from the second you wake up to the second you close your eyes at night, what do you do? And from there, we start layering on restorative activities that are specifically linked to something you already do automatically. So it makes it a kind of a habitual opportunity to get rest. Because if you know every day, for example, if you know every day you're going to brush your teeth, you know, that's not yeah. something you're likely to forget because yeah, it's yeah. ingrained in your brain. I'm going to get out of bed and brush my teeth. If we combine that known habit with a new habit, like let's say if you're trying to get more spiritual rest, you're going to pray as you brush your teeth, or you're going to listen to maybe something affirmative if you are someone who's dealing with negative mindset and emotional rest deficit, you're going to listen to maybe some affirmations. You're going to click it on your phone as you're brushing your teeth, or you're going to play music. If you're someone who needs creative rest, you're going to play, you know, a selection of music while you brush your teeth, whatever it might be, but you're going to do that automatically as you start brushing your teeth. So now you don't have to create time for something. Mm -hmm. You already had the time blocked out for something you're already doing. You're just going to layer on a restorative activity automatically to make that become a part of your routine. That is such a good idea. (laughs) Wow. As you were speaking, I was like, oh yeah, I could definitely apply that. And oh gosh, thank you. So what are some of the things that you do to stay restored and integrated in those areas of rest? Yeah. So I'm constantly doing a a bit of self-analysis um, throughout the week, throughout the day, honestly, (laughs) to see how well rested I feel. Mm -hmm. So, you know, every morning I wake up, I wake up and I ask myself, you know, do I feel energized? Do I feel ready to start the day? You know, I'm I'm almost ranking myself, so to speak on a scale to one to 10, how, how prepared do I feel to enter this day? And so if I ever come back and I'm like, you know, I don't feel too hot right now, you know, I'm feeling drained. I then kind of do a quick mindful activity of going through those seven and and looking at what, how have I poured out the day before or the week before? Where is the place most likely to be at risk for a rest deficit? I don't necessarily go through the quiz, you know, every day, but I'm, but that's basically what I'm doing because I'm, I know the seven, I'm aware of them. I can take a look at my life quickly and say, oh, you know, last week was very difficult. I, you know, wrote four articles and did this. I use a lot of creative energy. And so that's the, and I didn't get out, you know, it was raining, I'm stuck in my house or whatever it is. And so, you know, that's the area that's been, been depleted or last week, you know, something happened and, you know, with the world we live in, you know, something happened and a school full of children got shot for no apparent reason. So my spirit's kind of vexed at looking at the evil in the world. And so, and I haven't discussed that with anybody. I've kind of held all those emotions in. So my emotional rest is not where it needs to be because I haven't really let anybody into how that's affecting me, what that does to me. And so, you know, we have to kind of take a look at what's going on around us, how it's affecting us, and then just be really true, truthful to ourselves about the place that has been depleted and then specifically seek restorative activities to build back up whatever that is. Well, that's very, very good advice. This has been a very enjoyable conversation. Thank you so much, Dr. Dalton Smith, for sharing your wisdom with us. And I want to keep asking you more questions, but I might have to bring you back for a part two in the future. Uh, But I would just love for you to share, if someone wanted to learn more um, about your books, about your research, about the work that you do with, with companies, where can they go? The first place to go would just be my main website at drdaltonsmith.com. It's just D-R-Dalton, D-A-L-T-O-N, smith.com. 
Um, from there, you can learn about my books. From there, you can also learn about the work we do at the Storises. And um, there's a link on there as well to click and learn about the work we do with corporations and organizations. And then if you're interested in the REST quiz, it's very simple, restquiz.com. Um, and when you fill that out, what happens is you will get one email that lets you know what your score is in all of the seven, as well as links to what you mentioned was the Sacred Rest Challenge, which is a 30-day challenge. It's free, and both of those are completely free. But it's a 30-day challenge that every day you get one email, super short, because I'm not about wasting breath. So <laughs> super short, that gives you kind of an idea of how to get rest in one of the seven areas. And really the purpose of that is, is to expand your mindset on what are restorative activities? What does that look like? And it tells you which of the seven types of rest that it's applied to so that if, you know, whatever area you're needing within that 30 days, you'll get a couple of ideas of ways to get more rest in that area. Wonderful. And I will link both of those to my show notes. So thank you again, Dr. Dalton Smith, for your time, for your expertise, and for sharing your wisdom with us. And I hope that everyone listening, you really do take advantage of the quiz as well as the challenge and that you get more rest and you feel more refreshed so that just like Dr. Dalton Smith said, that you can bring your best self to those around you and to the world. So thank you everyone for listening and I'll see you at the next episode.